This oh, is oh. written off. No, damn, get the hands down. I got to stop doing the Italian thing. All right, there's your first outtake for the end of this. <laughs> This is Written Off, the show dedicated to recycling the refuse of pop culture. We'll sift through other people's garbage, and sometimes our own, to re-examine stories both overhated and underappreciated. Minus all the hot takes and rage bait. We'll champion the narratives that don't fit the narrative while killing the sacred cows of the zeitgeist. Like any good story, we aim to challenge and inspire and maybe, just maybe, give you something to think about. My name is John Walsh, and I'm a writer, editor, and educator by trade. And I'm Josh Howard. I am an artist writer. Um, I've been making comics and stories for uh, 20 years now. Uh, so, John, we're doing this finally. We, uh, we are. This is uh, something that, quite frankly, has been at least about 14 years in the making, if you want to go back far enough. Yeah, and off and on, we've talked about doing something like this. Of course, we've started doing um, weekly conversations. We'll, <laughs> we'll talk hours into the night about all kinds of things, usually story related. So we decided, hey, why, why not put it on camera? As for why written off, Josh and I began to notice a theme that a lot of the things that we loved most were the things that the world hated, cast aside, did, uh, said, we're not talking about that right now. We're talking about this thing. And we always found whatever it was that was uh, the current kind of focus of the zeitgeist was uninteresting, boring. And then meanwhile, all these amazing, gorgeous stories were just buried into the refuse pile of pop culture. And we figured, you know what? Those stories need a champion. And while we are both very uh, humble and modest, um, we also figure, you know what, someone's got to step up and uh, and say it's time to have really good, honest, uh, deep dive discussions about those types of stories. And uh, But we also both are willing to admit when we are wrong. And so we thought, why not put a show together where we get to put all that and basically have the focus be having good, solid, honest discussions about stories and... So here we are. Welcome to Written Off. Yeah, that's right. And also, also to a disclaimer, we we are probably going to often take positions that are going to upset um, people, but we're not doing it to with the intention of up, up, upsetting. Um, we are always be honest about how we feel about things. We don't have we have no agenda other than to uh, give our honest opinions about how we feel about stories movies, films, whatever it may be. Um, we're here to be the champions of the outcasts. Absolutely. We, uh, we know what it's like to be uh, on the outskirts of, of, of opinion. And so we, we hope that at some point, whatever that we're talking about, that uh, maybe you feel comfortable or comfortable stepping up and saying, hey, you know what? I actually really like that thing, too. It, uh, it, was, uh, it deserved more love. So... Hopefully, hopefully we will find that we are, in fact, not actually alone in all of our opinions, Josh. That's right. uh, ultimately the hope here, right? So for our first episode, um, what we're going to do is actually focus on uh, my work a little bit um, for a couple of reasons. One, because um, uh, written off... Um, uh, my work sort of follows under under this uh, category as I'm definitely not a, a mainstream creator. I've always been an indie creator. Um, and uh, I uh, do have a campaign going on right now for um, the latest um, book in my series, which is called Two Bird and Throttle. And we're going to go a little, a little bit into that and why it uh, falls under the banner of written off and why I think um, you should check it out. So, so John, um, I don't know if you want to start where we sort of first met. I can't remember what, what came first. Well, probably T-Bird came first, obviously. Um, but we met, what, what, what year was that? 
Can you remember? So that? the first <clears throat> first year we uh, we met, it's a, this is 2007. So to kind of set the scene here, um, Josh and I now, of course, are uh, very, very, very close friends. Uh, but it did start out with the potential to be comic book artist and that guy who's just a little too into my work. Um, and I'm very thankful that I managed to go from that uh, that place uh, to be able to call this man one of my uh, absolute closest and dearest friends. Um, so 2007, I am just random internet search for something, probably Bruce Timm's art. Uh, I was a very big fan of, of Bruce Timm. And this art kind of pops up and I go, whoa, who is that artist? Uh, and it turns out it's this guy named Josh Howard. And uh, he had a, a book called uh, Dead at 17 and another one called Black Harvest uh, at this time. I was and uh, within 30 minutes of discovering Josh's art, I had purchased every single available issue and art book that I could find between online comic book stores and eBay. Um, it was just one of those things where I didn't know why I was going to love this man's work, but somehow I knew I was going to. I was willing to to dive in that deep. Um, and so Black Harvest, Josh, is actually the first book of yours um, that I read. And I was someone who had kind of become strange to comics. Um, I was never I was never a big reader of the big two. I'm going to be very upfront here. I'm no uh, expert on, you know, Spider-Man and X-Men and all of that. I always was the guy that was reading weird little either adaptation comics or stuff that was kind of off the beaten path. And so I, I was finding that those things weren't really available. I wasn't really finding those things in 2007. And then Black Harvest arrives at my uh, at my front door and I open that up and I fall madly in love with the comic storytelling format again. I, I owe it that completely to, to, to Josh. And I said, this is something amazing. And I dive into um, Dead, Dead at 17. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm repping my favorite character, uh, Violet, from Josh's Dead at 17. Um, and that's the point where I was like, okay, I, I, I'm officially a fan. 2007, I came and stopped by your table. I was just a random guy, had you draw. Uh, some art of Violet for me. Got a, a San Diego Comic Con, awkward, right? Exactly, San Diego yeah. Comic Con, 2007. Uh, very awkward picture that my dad took of the two of us. <laughs> uh, neither one of us is uh, particularly comfortable in photographs. Um, but then 2008, the you know now I've read through your whole catalog up to that point, and you're continuing uh, dead. You're continuing dead at 17 at that point. And that was the point where I was then able to kind of come up to you at a table and be like, hey, I have a question about your work. I have, you know, I'm diving deep into that. And so between 2008 and 2010 was this kind of slow progression of just becoming a uh, absolute super fan of Josh's um, and just diving deeper and deeper. And I actually, before the show, Josh, I was digging through our old emails and I find oh, no. it funny that our conversations slowly were working their way up to, to the impetus for written off where in talking about your work, I would mention, Oh, Hey, there's this thing that no one else likes. I hope you're not <laughs> offended, but I find a connection between it and your work. And then you coming in with, my goodness, I love that thing too. And it happened over and over yeah. and over again. And the watershed moment was in 2010, uh, Witch Queen. You're in the middle of Witch Queen. Issue three has come out. And we start talking about pulling back layers as a storyteller, introducing a concept that stands on its own, but then as you continue it, pulling it back and looking behind and finding more depth and then pulling that back. And it starts us getting deep dive into the Matrix trilogy, which of course we then found out we both had a, we liked the first movie, but it wasn't until Reloaded and Revolutions that we went, whoa, we love this. And we had this exact same kind of connection and path with this movie 
and both of us going, yeah, no one else likes this movie but me, but we're going to talk about it here. And then you recommended Brandon Sanderson to me, and I, someone who has written off fantasy pretty across the board for a lot of my life, decided to take a chance on your recommendation. And that's the point where I think we knew we were the same kind of storytellers. We engaged with the same kind of stories, and the, oftentimes those stories are not the things that pop culture wants to talk about. They're, they're too, they require too much thought. They require you to maybe challenge some of your own assumptions. They require you to stop and think, and maybe a lot of times not even to love it instantly. You've got to let it sink in and soak. And so I, I really point to those that email exchange from 2010 that, that has just been brewing until now, finally, in the year of our Lord, 2023, we want to actually say, you know what? Let's have this conversation with more than just the two of us. Maybe there's someone else out there that wants to engage deeply in talking about the stuff that, that we have found and not just be, oh, that's cool or that sucks. No hot takes, no clickbait, none of that garbage. Actual deep dive. Let's be really honest about how we engage with stories and what's going on. And so that's really what brings us to, to here and the reason why I think T-Bird and Throttle is the perfect way to start this off is because the actual story of T-Bird and Throttle, when you dive into it, there is definitely an element of dealing with this very frustration of a culture that takes things that have a lot of depth to them and just kind of tosses it aside for things that are just nothing but shiny veneer. So... I'm glad that you picked this for our for our first topic. It's a, a trust me if you're listening here this is not a self-serving choice. This is something where it's like this is I mean one it, is, it, is a, it is a little thing. bit. I mean, okay, well, I'm going to give you a little bit more but we, credit. Like, we want to get it out of the way so we can like do shows about the stuff we really love, right? Abs- absolutely. Um, it is it's a yeah. it's a great personal way to introduce the concept um and and begin it. So so Josh, you um, that's kind of how we know each other and everything. How did T-Bird come to life? Because it's one of your oldest projects, isn't it? Yeah. So um, the year was 1998 or 99. I'm working at a comic book shop and uh, I'd already been working on, uh, I, I decided at this point, I'd already decided that comics is what I wanted to do. And I had already been messing around with a few ideas. I think um, Dead at 17 technically came first, but um, I'm at the comic store. I'm looking around at all the um, different books on the shelves, looking at all the the ideas, the motifs of all the characters that are taken. I'm thinking um, there's not a guy who's like car man or has like a, a vehicular motif, right? Except for, I happen to be the, really the Transformers. So that's probably where this idea came from. So I thought, what if you had a, a guy, a superhero, with a with an engine in his chest, right? And, oh, he'd be called T-Bird, like a Thunderbird, and blah, 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 blah. So I drew it as a joke. And uh, I drew it on a, on a backing board of a comic, I remember. I wish I still had it, but I don't. Um, and it was kind of a funny thing. And I went home, got out my sketchbook, and I started drawing him again. And drum some more and i started like i, I kind of like this guy like i kept playing around with it i was like oh there could be something here and i was like what if you get a sidekick named throttle who like had to go and restart the engine when he like powered down or whatever he ran out of energy and um oh that concept didn't really stay but that was sort of the impetus for how things began so um this starts i started building filling my sketchbook with this stuff and um but however, Dead of 17 was sort of the priority, and that's sort of what the story I really focused on at the time. And so I made a whole little um, ash can, what they used to call them. It's a black and white self-published thing. I made it at Kinko's and um, gave it out to people or whatever. And then it was a couple years later, I had it in my portfolio, and there was a publisher starting up um, locally here in uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. Who was looking? Who are looking for local artists? So, thought, well, I'm local, so I've got a, I've got a pretty good shot. It narrows the field to <laughs> here at least, right? So I got an interview right away. Um, 
they hired me to draw a book that they were creating. So um, they hired me, started paying me. I drew, I want to say three issues of this book that they had created. And then uh, Diamond, Diamond Previews, who distributes comics to stores, they ended up rejecting it. Um, they said it wasn't because of the art. Thank goodness it was because of the story. The story wasn't <laughs> quite at the snuff. Um, so Viper, uh, Viper Comics was the publisher. So they were kind of scrambling, okay, what are we going to do? We put out some all this money to this. We need a book. So they were like, how about that Theta 17 thing in your portfolio? And I was like, well, I, I kind of moved on from that. I was ready to do other things. They're like, no, we really like it. We need a, a book. I go, okay, we can put this out if you allow me. Give me the time to redraw it and redo it because it was pretty crude. Um, by that point. So they're like, okay, cool. But you've got two months to knock out three, three issues because um, San Diego, San Diego comic con is coming up. It's going to be their first comic con and mine. And they wanted to be able to go there and advertise the book knowing that it was coming out. So they, and diamond needed three issues to approve. So I was like, okay, so the, I, what forward completing this impossible task of completing writing, drawing, coloring, three issues in two months. And I had no, I had no, I, I had drawn the original Ashcan one story. I didn't know, I didn't have a story past that at that point. But I go with this bear down and I get, I get it done. And then we are at Comic Con uh, that year, and Diamond comes up to the table and says, "You're in." So we got the, the approval while we were at Comic-Con. So anyway, all that to say, I thought, okay, cool. I'll do these, these, this mini series of Dennis 17, and then I'll get, move on and do T-Bird, the thing I've been waiting to do. So I finish, it was technically four issues. They just did the three. So I did, did the four and then I was going to go, I started on T-Bird and I started on T-Bird drawing it and stuff. And then this was, the fall of that year, right? It was after Comic Con. Data 17 number one comes out in November while I'm working on T Bird. And then it basically sells out instantly. And then it starts getting all this buzz. And like, people are like, what is this? What is this? So it kind of, I wouldn't say blows up because obviously I'm not a household name or anything. But for the indie comic scene and where the, the way comics were at the time, it, it garnered a lot of buzz. It got a lot of attention. It was in Wizard Magazine and all that stuff. So Viper was like, I think we should keep this going and maybe put T-Bird on the back burner. So that's what happened. So T-Bird kind of went to the side. I was like, okay, let's strike while the iron's hot. Let's do more Data 17. So I did that, did a couple more miniseries, and I thought, okay, now I'm going to go back to T-Bird. And I want to say this was 2007 or eight. Um, I started again and started with a zero issue. Um, I don't know why that was always the way I always envisioned this, this book going. So I did a zero issue and that came out again. I think it was 2007 or eight, eight, I believe if I remember okay. correctly. Okay. So that came out and then this is around the time there was like a big financial crisis, whatever. And everyone took a hit. Viper took a hit. I had finished issue one and then it never came out because of Vipers having struggling, everyone was struggling. So it died right there. Um, so I was like, okay, well, great. So, and after that, I think I went, I took Data 17 to Image and did a lot of stuff over there. Um, and then uh, finished Data 17 and Kate came to the, the finale. I wrapped all that up and then I was like, okay, what am I going to do now? And uh, this was 2015. And I kind of had this weird idea that now that I finished my big, you know, indie magnum opus, I'm going to go be able to work for the big two, you know? Um, <laughs> now I had done little work as a side note. I've done, I've done work for DC sub label at one point. Um, nothing anyone's ever heard of, but but that was the closest I have gotten. No one had let me touch, you know, any of the big characters. But I thought, oh, well, I have this thing behind me now. But no one, no one wanted to talk to me. No one had anything to do with me. Um, so I was like, well, 
I guess this is the time to just strike it on my own and see if I can get, you know, do something with T-Bird. And uh, so I went and wrote the whole thing. Um, ended up being a pretty big, pretty big script that I broke up into four parts. And then um, it's like, what am I going to do with this? Right. And I was like, well, I guess I'm going to crowdfund it. Um, so at Comic-Con, this was 2017. Comic-Con that year, I put together a new I issue zero. Um, and debut it there to kill, build a little bit of buzz. And then I launched the first campaign um, that fall. And I, I met my goal, but it was pretty, it was pretty, it was like around 8,000 and I met my goal. And then once I made the first issue, I sent it out to all the publishers. Like I even gave it to them in hand at Comic-Con the next year. And no one cared. No one was interested. So I was like, okay, I guess this is where I'm at. I am doing crowdfunding now. So uh, went forward with that. And um, it's, it is built, built and built and built. And each campaign did a little bit better. And um, to where we're now, I'm, I finished the first four for issue arc, which was like one complete story, which is sort of the origin, uh, the beginning of T-Bird and all that. And now I'm continuing the story with uh, T-Bird and Thrall versus the Ape Men. So that's the background, the history sort of in a nutshell of T-Bird. Um, uh, we can go a little bit deeper into the story and sort of how that Something all lines I up with... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Something I'd like to add here is a little bit of perspective, just for people that maybe not connecting the dots here. So, Josh, when you're saying, like, okay, no one's really interested in picking it up, <clears throat> yes. an important bit of context here is the fact that it is constantly, that it's, it's, it's almost a mantra. Superheroes? You can't be doing that. That's Marvel and DC's thing. Right, right. It, it, there is this absolute just almost embargo against like you're gonna do something with superheroes? No, you aren't. You can't do that. Like it, it's like indie comics are allowed to be a lot of other things, but superheroes aren't one of them. Well, and of course, and, and Marvel DC won't take new ideas. So exactly and, right. And the thing is, I'm not a superhero guy. M 99% of my ideas are not super, or my stories are not superhero. But this is a story that happens to fit within the genre and is the perfect vehicle for the story. So um, I understand on the outside, it looks like, why are you even bothering? You know, like Marvel and DC got this cornered, you know, like you said. Indies like, are like, we don't want to touch that stuff. So that's part of the reason why it was just like a no-go from, from the start. So, yeah, you're right. Um, but it really is because uh, this was something for me. I, so I, you know, I loved everything Josh had done up to this point, and I remember when he said, "Like, oh yeah, my next thing's going to be a it's it's about a superhero named T Bird and his sidekick Throttle." And my initial reaction is, "Okay, is this where we're going to part ways? Like, is <laughs> is is this going to happen?" And so that first issue zero, the the Viper issue comes out, and it is to this day. And Josh is going to get all all humble about this. It is still to this day my absolute favorite issue of comics that I have ever read. It is a master class in telling a complete, amazing, enthralling story with the bare minimum amount of information to pull you into a universe. But even before I ever got to see that unpublished issue one, I just lived in that world of that issue zero and it captivated me and so all these years it was always after that when that through that false start of going okay josh uh what what when when is it going to be t-bird's turn i i went from someone who was like i don't know i don't really like superhero comics am i gonna like this thing to uh to being just the thing that i would not quite frankly shut up about um to josh and i wasn't alone there were others of us that um who again <clears throat> were kind of trepidatious about the idea but the second josh gave us that invitation to the world it it's like okay we got to go back 
Um, and so I'm absolutely thrilled that now T- it's T Bird's time. You know, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's 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 your uh, it's your your main goal. Yeah, I mean, it's worth noting that I guess, like you said, that it was you and people like my friend Pat and others who have kept this. There was times where I didn't know if I was just really going to come back to it, and, but you guys kept it alive. Um, so, yeah. Um, so let's, I guess, get into a little bit of what T-Bird is actually about. Um, just the, 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 in a nutshell, T-Bird is about uh, a guy named Mitch Maddox, who was an astronaut who finds this alien artifact on the moon, and it ends up bonding with him, gives him superpowers. So he ends up becoming the superhero name was T-Bird. And but then there's an accident with his powers that results in um, a tragedy. Uh, so the story picks up 10 years later as he's uh, pick up the pieces of his life and trying to restart his superhero career while trying to raise his, his uh, teenage daughter on his own. And then um, his past come back to, comes back to haunt him and the media it could be said the media is probably the main villain in a way of T Bird. <laughs> there are some there are some regular villains, but the media definitely takes a center st- center st- seat in, a, in these stories. Um, so John, you recently reread T Bird for the show. I, just just literally tonight uh, beforehand, <laughs> I. Uh, I pulled out my my trade paperback of uh, T Bird Throttle versus the Moon Men, um, which collects uh, again that that issue zero, the new issue zero that that Josh was was mentioning, and then the the four books, and these weren't these weren't your usual thin little comic books, were they, Josh? These were like nice double size, sixty page, uh, actually you know, triple issues. size, triple size. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So yeah, this um, you know this is you know. It's going to take you a little bit to, you know, to get through. Uh, what's, I'm so glad it, it had been a little bit. Um, and I have to admit, the when I first kind of read through after issue four came out and it was my first full read through, I still had in the back of my mind that original issue zero from back in 2008 still had that unpublished issue. Well, and, and you did make changes, right? I the remember, story though. did evolve. In 2017, when I gave you the new issue zero, your reaction was not what I expected. I, it, I, I will. So it's funny. It was one of those ones because again, you got to remember like some context here. Is the original 2008 issue zero is my all-time favorite issue of comics. <laughs> um, uh, as was something that will probably end up being a, an episode of written off on its own. I will always tell Josh that it was the nowhere man of comic book world (laughs) something that was cut off before its full story was told but it's told so well that you can live by itself as something that i'll think about for forever and still not necessarily feel incomplete so it, it really is just a lightning in a bottle issue of comics for me so having my love for that and then suddenly it comes out and it's different the art your art has evolved a bit so the characters look a little bit different the pacing of the story when you decided to reveal certain things um there's a there's a huge potential reveal at the end of that original issue zero and you actually moved that plot point much later um into i believe like issue uh, issue three well, of and it's it's still playing out technically it, it, so. exactly right it's still yeah. not um you know resolved out so to me i watch i read this new issue zero and I'm like, well, where's the punch? Where's the, where's this? I, I, I had not gotten out of the old universe fully. And so now with some time back, I open it up and it's like, it's perfect. It's the perfect opening for this. It's, it's brilliant. <laughs> it's having finally shed that preconceived notion. And that's one of the things that is going to be a very common recurring theme on Written Off is recognizing where our biases are and where other people's biases are coming from and trying to remove that from the equation to really get down to it. And so this was the first time I was able to really fully dive into T bird and throttle this version and have it be the version, not just, Oh, a new, a new one. So I, I can say Josh, 
I, 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 have, I have to eat crow on that original <laughs> issue zero. When it's here at the front of this book, it dives in. It doesn't feel unnecessary. It's the perfect drawing. I now understand what you had in your mind when you were like insisting on, I've got to do this issue zero uh, thing. Like it's, it, it's got to be. it. Because um, one of the other things too that should be pointed out about this is comic books exist in the world of T-Bird and Throttle closer in a way to how newspapers and magazines exist. Like the world, like Century City consumes its information in a large portion through comic books. You know, yeah, so that's the, a very unique part of this universe. Right. The, the, so the concept behind that was, um, I've always kind of lamented the fact that comics, in, you know, our world, comics, have become increasingly more and more realistic. Um, they try to portray them. The drawings, the writing is to try to make it, oh, what if it was really, really in our world, right? And I, I always kind of bristle at that. Like, I like keeping it fantasy, you know, like costumes don't have to have every single rivet on them, you know, like, right. You don't have, it doesn't have to necessarily, you know, interact with like our politics and all this other stuff. So I thought, what if we did the inverse of that in T-Bird's world, right? Where it's like, um, it takes real world events and portrays them fantastically within comics, as opposed to our world where it takes fantastic ideas and portrays them realistically. So that's that was sort of the idea. So you've got comics in T Bird T world that are like about you know um, the the Senate or uh, politicians or a superhero. So superheroes are part of the world. Of course, there's going to be superhero comics, but comics can be about anything in in T Bird's world. So that's really uh, a fun idea. But um, but yeah. So um, let's just pull up. Um, up an issue here let's see all right so i think this is probably the part where i'm gonna say spoilers from here on out um yes just just to just to be aware um i i think this would be a great treat for people who are excited for the new campaign for t-bird and throttle versus the eight men um, as kind of a great kind of behind the scenes deep dive into, into the book. But if up to this point, this sounds like something fascinating to you, this might be a good spot as, as much as I hate to tell you to stop watching. Maybe if you want to preserve the, the story and the, all of its surprises for yourself, this might be the, this is probably the last safe place for you. So, all right, all right Josh, take us in. Yeah. So, um, this this uh, we start with the prologue. This is the zero issue, which was a just sixteen page prologue, um, and basically it kind of starts with a comic within a comic, as we were talking about. And this comic, you know, is kind of relaying um, T. Bird's origin of how he has this crash on the moon, discovers the engine, and then we cut we're, we're back in reality, and we're we're seeing uh, his daughter, his wife, and. Um, she's excited over him being in a comic. And so it's like a big deal, you know, oh, you're a comic hero and all this stuff. And of course he gets a uh, message. He has, he's got a situation to go resolve and then he takes off and um, something's, something's off with his wife. Right. So we find out that not all is well, you know, in the Maddox household. So, um, Say that because he goes and we meet his sidekick, um, Amy Sparks, aka Throttle. Um, she was a former MMA fighter who got kind of sort of drafted and um, stuck with him. Like they needed, you know, some some PR, some good PR for him because he's kind of rough around the edges. So we put this cute girl with him. He's really popular. Maybe we can make him a, a, a team. So they're still trying to get to you know know each other, work together. And he has this this weird threat. He's got to you know take down who's Kind of hinting about all this weird stuff that makes no sense at this point in the story, and it comes into this play. Is, later. This is this uh, is one of the things with this encounter is it reminds me so much of uh, the Grave Mind from Halo Two. It's this weird creature you don't really know what its deal is. It's speaking in and kind of in riddles. Uh, there's a you know a, um, a cadence to it. Um, and that's always that's one of those things that's a 
real draw to me. So it's really funny that this didn't hit me right the first time because the second time I'm like, this is so brilliant. This is everything. <laughs> I, I love this stuff. But again, finding a way to throw off the shackles of preconceived notions and engaging a story for the story, not what you want it to be, not what you think it um, it should be, but what it actually is presenting. As I just, uh, I, I, it's again such a great opening here. This 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 encounter with this this thing. Right. Yeah. I wanted to, to see much something that was sort of just crazy and inconsequential, and you don't really realize how much it means until much later. So yeah. So the the vanquish this threat. He um, to kind of have some sort. Some flirtation going on here, but she tells. I see. Uh, uh, far, far point is mentioned. Uh, <laughs> Easter egg for uh, for future written uh, off. Uh, there we go. Definitely, That's right. Definitely, little, definitely some Star Trek hidden in in there. Little Star Trek reference. Um, she tells them, you know, let's let's not do this. Let's go home to your wife and etc. So they go their separate ways, and then a little bit later, he comes over and says, "They're dead. It's all my fault. I did it. I killed them. They're dead." Oh my God! Who did he, what? What happened? So this is this is your prologue. This is um, the setup, and here we we start with this is book one, and we go into again another telling of the origin. This time, from a sort of this is not the comics perspective. This is sort of um, uh, kind of an overview from someone's perspective. Um, you get sort of. Um, insight into uh, Mitch's relationship with his daughter and some background of, you know, he's in the military, he was an astronaut and all that stuff. And then we switch I, to... This transition here, this transition, <clears throat> pull, pull that back up so you can see these 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 two yeah. again. This, <clears throat> I, I, this is where I, like I say, when I say Josh is like my kind of storyteller, there is a reason why I was drawn to his, <laughs> his art, is uh, he always manages to find a way for these moments to hit. This beautiful, wonderful, amazing picture of just, you know, you know, um, mom and dad, you know, daughter, this perfect hallmark moment. Take a picture, mom, take a picture. And then to actually see that picture and it's cracked and it's just that you turn that page and it it hits and, and just this image. And there's so many great moments that uh, in T-Bird where this timing it's 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 almost cinematic in the way that two things are are put together moments of time separated um uh and it tells a whole story just in the juxtaposition of the of, of the two images so this is that first kind of taste of of just uh of that kind of storytelling thank you john the check is in the mail <laughs> uh -huh. No, all seriousness. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, so we go on to yeah. You see that obviously things have gone terribly wrong somehow. Um, so yeah, he contemplates you know doing the unthinkable, and then um, he's shaken out of it by dad, and he now we're in present day, and Emily's grown up. And he's dropping her off at school for the first time. Uh, She's been homeschooled up until this point. So she's going to public school. And uh, then uh, Mitch is off to Centennial City Con. And uh, we get this image of him fighting and then pull back and realize this is his convention banner. And this is, <laughs> there are many things in, in T Bird in, uh, that are semi autobiographical, or I, I pulled from real life experience. So let's put it that way. Um, so he's sitting here, he's watching, you know, the lines for like some of the, the new young heroes. And he's just, like, why am I doing this? Why am I putting myself out here like this? You know, and um, he's watching, you know, all these other guys get the, all the attention. Uh, then some the kids come up and he's thinking um, for their front autograph and, uh, and, um, no, they just, they've never heard of this guy. Like, they don't know what he's doing here. So he just. Yeah, they've, they've made a point of walking right. up to the table to, to say, comment that we don't know what this is. Which I have experienced more than yes, a, I, more I than have been, times. I have played the part 
of the guy sitting next to the person that the booth is for. And yeah, I absolutely not just you. I mean, I, I've, I've been at other booths and this is all too real. All too yeah. real. They, they walk up and they staring and they're like, what is this? Like almost like what ner- the nerve you have to be here and you're not affiliated with Spider-Man. Like, what are you doing? Like, how, how dare I not yes. have heard of you before? Right. I have no intent. <laughs> I have no intention of correcting that. Just how dare. Right. Yes. And so, uh, yeah. So, um, uh, also, yeah. Anyway. So, yeah. So th- this goes on and, uh, finally someone else comes up and he's just like, had it. He's like, Kitty cat man's that way. Concessions that way, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. Like, where's, where's the bathroom? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's always yep. the thing. Like, yeah. It's like you're, you're the information booth. Yep. <laughs> So anyway, this, this this chick comes up and she's here to see him, but she doesn't want to autograph or anything. She's here to deliver a letter. Um, this organization um, called Starlink, which was the name of the it's the NASA of this world, and unfortunately, Starlink has now been taken in the real world. So <laughs> there's no affiliation with Elon Musk. I had this name way before, way before. Anyway, so they've been trying to contact him. This is who he used to work for. They need to talk to him, and he doesn't want anything, anything to do with them. He's he's moved on. Um, but so then we get a flashback, um, and we see Mitch um, with his crew uh, on a routine mission, and they're struck by something in space and have to make an emergency landing on the moon. And then we're back to the present. Um, we see Emily trying to fit in a school and she sticks out like a sore thumb. No one, everyone's looking at her like they know her or they know something about her. She's, something's not right. So we're back to the convention. And, Wait, uh, hold on. What? what? Your favorite character drawn as a cat? Oh. <laughs> yeah, there, there's some How things. much for that? How much for that? <laughs> Get in line because everyone wants this. This, this shot just kills me because this is th- this is what a significant portion of our comic conventions have become the the t-shirt giant t-shirt booth that's like 16 stories tall that's this nerd thing plus this nerd thing and your favorite character is well, or or the fine art print wall which is like <laughs> you know something to where it's just the furthest thing from fine art right yeah, this um, is this is this is my my some of my favorite meta commentary here as someone who has watched comic conventions change over the last several years. It's just uh, hysterically yeah. on the nose. I'm not, I'm not bitter at all. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but I've been next to the cat person. I I've been there anyway. So anyway, you get to look at some of the comics like we were talking about earlier, the comics of the world. A couple of you know, Superior, Justice Superior, Laser Cat. Then we have Presidential Power. You know. New term, new first issue, right? And then, um, then we see the clearance bin, and T Bird sees his issue, the the issue from ten years ago, you know, before everything went crazy here. And uh, and then he sees new releases, and then, what's this? It's a T Bird a book. It's a new release, but it says T Bird exposed the true untold story. So um, he picks it up, and he is not happy with what he sees. And then. He's uh, his his partner. Oh, this is this is uh, this character is Batty Hoffman. This is sort of his agent. This is a guy who's sort of like you know a fan, a buddy who decided to help try, try to get him back out there. So anyway, he comes back to the table, and I like this little in joke. He's picked up an issue of uh, just a superior, the new hot you know superhero. Like even he's not immune to the you know the new hip thing. Um, <laughs> but he finds out that T Bird has already left the building and is on his way to Starlink headquarters. And here we meet um, the director of Starlink, which is um, uh, Straker, Ed Straker, who is <clears throat> named after uh, a character in the old series UFO, which always stuck that character, and that's one of an homage to him. That's why he has the white hair and everything. So anyway, he bursts in, and it's time for them to have a talk. Um, so they go over the uh, the comic and. Uh, 
Tiber's talking about, um, there's things in here that only people in this room know. So you guys must have be behind this or leaked stuff. And they, they claim to have no knowledge, uh, not responsible. So they want to, they, it's like, why am I here? So here's what's going on. They need to talk to him because they have detected an energy signature on the moon that uh, matches the energy signature of the engine. Right, the but not exact, right? right? That's one of the right. things I love. It's, right, it's not exact, right? but it's unmistakable. It's got to be connected. So right. what so is it? The implication is, is there another engine? There's a, Is there something connected to it? So yeah, so this, this piques his interest. Um, and we have not, we have flashed back to the crash. Um, and this is where they're trying to figure out what hit them. Um, but they have to be careful because they're in moon man territory. So in the world of Tiber, there is a strange race that inhabits the moon that are uh, shorthanders called the moon man, which is in this world is sort of a considered a racist term, right? You it's called them Lunarans or, you know, whatever. Lunar natives. Or, yes, right, yeah. yeah, right. So, but they're, they're notoriously hostile and territorial. So um, no one knows much about them. So they have to be careful. So they decide to go and check this out. And they find the crash site and the readings are like crazy. So they look at it and it's this bizarre device. Um, they, they theorize could be a, a ship's engine or power source. Um, and then there's a blood splatter and then boom, Mitch has got a hole in his chest. The moon men, have attacked. Um, so they're trying to figure out, should they leave or should they go? Do they abandon Mitch? And then his buddy Jack is like, no, we're not leaving him. Um, and then the engine starts to glow and then it's bonded with Mitch and it's basically saving his life. And then just unleashes this, this, you know, this crazy uh, power and just obliterates uh, the moon men. So back to the present, uh, a little bit more about, they're talking about the, you know, what we talked about earlier, the engine and the, the readings. And basically, he's wanting Mitch to go back up there on a covert mission to find out what's going on. And if he does this, he will reinstate Mitch as a, an officially sponsored super agent. So again, in this world, um, most superheroes get by with a sponsorship from either a corporation or the government. And so, uh, before the fallout for Mitch's accident, Starlink sponsored him as a, as a superhero. And they're, he's, what they're saying is, we'll do it again. We'll back you if you go on this mission that, you know, no one can know about. And if you're caught, we'll disavow you. But this is your chance back and, you know, to be in a superhero. So he's debating whether to take this, this chance, you know, and, uh, they're kind of going back and forth with his with his agent. He's he's worried about Mitch Mitch being set up, but uh, Mitch really wants the shot. So he realizes he's got to pick up his daughter. He goes to pick her up, and she is not happy with it. something's going wrong. It's more than just he's late to pick her up. There's something else. So um, he's trying to figure out what's going on, and then out from under her door, she pushes the comic. Um, someone at school has given this to her, and he now realizes that. He sent her out to public school where everyone knows what happened, especially with this comic coming out and whatever is in it, you know, is not good. You know, his daughter is very upset. So he takes a, you know, a stroll. He's, this is a old stomping grounds, the garage. This is where he used to be. It's sort of his, his, his back cave, right? Um, it's kind of in a state of, you know, disrepair and he sees his old uh, mural and it's been vandalized. Murderer, homewrecker, gruesome was here. And then we go to. I love uh, that. Uh, I love that up to this point, uh -huh. gruesome is the bad wolf. For anyone else that's a Doctor Who fan, is the this is like the bad wolf of this universe <clears throat> so far. It's if you've looked at the details, the name has crept up in little corners, is becoming slowly and slowly more. Uh, prominent that's that's something i really appreciated re after rereading through knowing what where we're going that noticing these details are there that, that that's building up and, and and there are others that are still playing out uh to this day 
Um, right here, in fact, devour us, uh, Lord Exo. Uh, so anyway, so he he's there. We got to this club. And he's there's a, basically a street preacher out there um, preaching about we are the design. He's the intelligence, and talking about some bizarre ideas, and um, talking about someone called Io and that they will offer purification from corruption, um, from the power of the elements. So he goes in to have a drink, and uh, some people notice him and um, start giving him a hard time, telling him, you know, he's got a lot to answer for. He's a, he's a murderer, he's a racist, he's a misogynist, you know, all, all, the, all the fun buzzwords. And... Uh, they they warn him um, that within in this in this world and, and uh, there's a zoning ordinance for superheroes that you can't use your powers in certain areas and this, a lot of this comes back to like the accident that he had um, is to keep people safe but it is also a hindrance to what superheroes can or can't do so anyway he decides to leave they yell him out and um, after he's out they they um, ambush him um and then he has a flashback and you get these images of something that happened um in the past and then uh police show up break it up and then you find out that the the police is actually his former sidekick and then uh cut down to the comic and we go into the comic and see what it's all about and we get this super exaggerated um version of the story super distorted where it trace them out to be, you know, super, you know, uh, sort of um, egotistical and he's smoking a cigar and just um, it portrays the moon men as, you know, super peaceful. And he's just like a bloodthirsty, just murdering them right off the bat. Um, shows him as like really rotten to his wife and that, you know, uh, he drove her into someone else's arms and then, in his anger, he just obliterated them, you know, and his daughter is the only survivor. And then it talks about how there were some shady deals that got him off the hook and he didn't have to go to jail and all this stuff. And just tell it just really paints him in a bad light. And the thing is, at this point, you don't know what's true, right? Like it's some, it could be some truth to this, could be no truth. And so you see someone stomp on the, uh, the comic and then they uh, write on the wall and gruesome was and now is here. That's the end of part one. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if I want to go to uh, super detail on the rest, but that's sort of the setup for the story. And as you go, you get more of into you, it's told in you get for the whole story, you get flashbacks. It's totally build up into build up, build up until you get the revelation of what happened. So you get to see sort of you know the experience of. You know, becoming a superhero, you come back to modern day and like find out what happened to his sidekick and why she's a cop and more uh, of what his daughter's dealing with. And so, yeah, and then uh, again, it slowly builds until much later when, also, oh yeah, you get the revelation of Chad Gruesome and which you don't know exactly who he is or what he is yet. Um, but you get that sort of revelation at the same time as the others. So, so yeah. Uh, so John. <laughs> yes, Josh. Since you just read this, uh, any, any other insight you want to offer anything I missed that you want to, uh, discuss? Uh, this, so this is where I, I, I have to decide, uh, how deep into, into spoilers I want to go. Um, so one of one of the things that uh, like amazes me is how deftly you handle two different time periods going back and forth. It can be really easy to lose a reader when you're you're jumping here and then there um especially when you're trying in certain cases to kind of blur the lines between the two, right? His right. flashbacks and, and and stuff like that. Um, but I, I love this kind of stuff. Um, uh, this goes, you know, this is one of the things that I loved about Lost when it was on television 
and uh, and was was telling these types of stories really well, where you're telling a story about what happened before and a story of what's happening now and merging the two of them together so that despite the two different time periods, it's still one cohesive story. I, I love this, uh, this kind of stuff. And the bookends. Book four, the start of book four is some of my absolute favorite stuff. And I, I don't know if I want to go and say any anything more than oh, that. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so what you're talking about is, so right here, the beginning of book one, um, you're getting a... Book a one is, right, is, a, is narrated by someone. You're getting a narration, right. and it's talking about, um, as it begins, origin stories. They're like songs, and it, the good ones were remembered and repeated and reinterpreted over and over again, usually begin a tragedy, kind of giving you an overview of sort of a, the superhero story and you know what it's all about. And what John's talking about is in book four, um, let me pull it up. You, um, you get the same narration, but this time you're getting different images with it. So it's like, okay, who, whose narration is this? Whose story is this? Um, exactly. And the, and the, and the <clears throat> differences between those two, um, it, it, it's it's one of my favorite bits. I, I loved it the moment it, issue four came out. I was instantly, it just hit me. That page where I was like, wow. Um, and it's just as strong uh, going through and reading it all, all in one go. Um, again, just, uh, I as my love for this story is as much about how it is told as it is the actual story itself. Um, one of the things that I have found for, I've, I've written a couple short comics and stuff like that. And I love that style of images with narration over it. Um, dialogue, the way my brain works is I often don't really think of things in terms of dialogue. So when people like you can tell a story with dialogue like that and make it feel natural and work. It's almost like a, a magic trick to me. Like, like, how do you do that? Because the way my brain inherently works is that link between image and, and language. And so the way book one opens, the way book four opens, that's how my brain works inside. So seeing a story told exactly the way that I would think of it, and have it be something I can hold in my hand and read. Someone else came with it, came up with it. I get to enjoy it rather than having to, you know, make it myself. It is just uh, a, a beautiful treat. And uh, I'm always, I'm always a big fan of when comics will work that type of uh, essentially scene, right, montage type of stuff into something. I just, I really go for it. I, I've got a real particular love for it. Well, I, I had the benefit of spending almost 20 years working on this story <laughs> and then writing it and rewriting it and rewriting it. And so the, the fact that it almost came out and didn't a few times turned out to be a big blessing. Like, I'm so glad it did not come out the first time. It's like, there were like three false starts. I am so glad it didn't come out any of those times and that I was able to spend more time with it. Because each time I wrote, it, it grew and became richer, and especially the last time, it the component that was missing was like sort of the real world experience that I had of just being in the industry and all the, the stuff I went through and was able to sort of put that, you know, into the story a little bit. Um, well, really so Amy, Amy Sparks is a character that was only mm -hmm. came into the story in this iteration. She did not exist before this, right? Well, even crazier when I went, decided to go and write this thing, for the, you know, to, to, to uh, crowdfund it. I wrote the big, you know, multi-part script. She was not in it. It was not until I decided to make the zero issue for Comic-Con that That's she was right. Created. I forgot uh, that that late. It, it, yeah. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. What? How? I was like, I had to go. So I had to go back to the original the scripts and like figure it out. But she fit in perfectly. Like it was just seamless, like how she easily she fit in and like i was like i can't believe this component was missing this whole time and uh yeah that's just that's what i love about writing so i love about stories is the 
it go, goes against this idea that things must be all planned out, exactly. right? It's the discovery. It's the things you find along the way that would have never been in the original plan. Um, that, to me, is the best part of storytelling, of enjoying stories, is that um, the discovery, you know? And when things work out that you could not have planned, those are the best things. Well, and also in knowing and knowing what ideas to pursue, because like you said, you right. when you're telling when you're talking about the story of this, right? And you're like, I just literally doodled a like wouldn't it be funny? Like he's a superhero, <laughs> but he's like, but he's a car, but he's not a transformer, right? It <laughs> that it, it's like you're like you made it to you laugh, but one of the challenges of a storyteller is to be able to recognize something that seems potentially ridiculous on the surface at first pass, but to realize the depth that's available there. And so, and all the best storytellers, when you start having them talk about how they developed it, almost all of them, it comes back to, they didn't have it all planned, right? It, it's, right. they were open to the discovery along the way. Um, and it it really is it it really is a narrative. It seems that spun kind of after the fact this idea of the creator who planned it all along. They planned it the whole time, and it it really is. There is so much need for that room to grow. Otherwise, stories feel stilted. You know, the best ones were the ones that naturally grew in, into uh, into what they were. Um, and so it's it, hearing your story of bringing T-Bird and Throttle to life. Uh, again, this is one of the reasons why I think it's such a perfect thing to open written off with is because it, it really does showcase a lot of the things that we're drawn to, the things that we feel like don't really get talked about and starts to get into why good stories work, at least for me as a fan of this. It's a it's a great um, centerpiece to talk about and point to and go see things like this. This is um, here's how you break down good stories into components and talk about why they work, not just oh, I enjoyed it. You right? getting into the deep discussion of what made it something to be connected to. Right. Yeah. So let's that brings us to um, I'm going to pull up the. Um, campaign for uh, for the latest issue. So we are now on T-Bird and Throttle versus the Ape Man. This is the technically the fifth chapter, um, but it is a, it is a standalone um, story. And I, what I mean by that is, it doesn't mean it's a throwaway. It just means that uh, as the first four were part of one arc, which is called T-Bird and Throttle versus the Moon Men, this one is just going to be one issue, but it's still a very important story. So, uh, Currently, yeah, so we're, as of this recording, we have nine days left and we're almost 75% funded. So anyway, with this campaign, uh, you said you're going to get a, a, new, a brand new chapter that's uh, around 60 pages, probably going to be a little bit more than that. Um, and on the campaign page, you get a preview of some of the uh, images and a little uh, blurbs about the characters. And um, you can also get the first for issues and a collected edition um, uh, as well. So you can get caught up if you haven't. Um, you're also able to read the first 60 pages here for free. Um, and uh, this goes a little, a little bit more of a detail about the perks and what you can get. There's some variant covers and um, some commissions, original art, although most of these are taken. I think there's, a, there's one or two left. And then for a stretch goal, you would get um, but we'll do a series of trading cards, and this one in particular is a sort of a King Kong homage to go with the ape theme. Um, then we'll have some reader feedback from stuff, and then that's it. And um, so that's the campaign. And um, so, yeah, if you haven't, I'd appreciate if you would check it out and back it. And, uh, yeah, let's keep this story going because uh, there's still a lot of story to tell, although I do have a – it is a finite – ending is not going to go on forever i do have an end in mind but there are a few more stories to tell so i'd like to keep keep this going so yeah check it out um 
Yeah, so I think that brings us to the end of our show. Well, what's uh, what's going to be next, Josh? I mean, you know, it's uh, if we consider this our our pilot uh, pilot episode. We get picked up. Where are, where are we going from here? What what would be something that you and I would be passionate about? That there might be something on the horizon that we'd want to discuss. What uh, what could possibly fit that bill? What's oh, real, before I get to that, real quick, the link for the campaign will be in the description for this video. So I'll get that out of the way. Okay, so yes, what will be next? I don't know. Is it, is a, it possible a... that Star Trek, that something that you and I have uh, at, a, at a time thought was six feet under and dead could possibly be coming back in the full spirit that made us fall in love with it a lifetime ago? Could it be? I can't think of a better... Uh, show to kick off besides after the this main this uh this first episode then Star Trek. So our next episode we'll be diving deep into uh, Star Trek and our uh, our relationship with it and maybe where we've written it off and how we've left it and maybe be coming back to it um as we go into this new season of Picard and what that may entail. Um, if you think we know what we're going to say, you do not know. So <laughs> <laughs> it's going to take some twists and turns. So, um, so yeah, we can't, cannot wait to get into that. So John, where can people find you? Um, I am available on Twitter at John J O H N J Walsh W A L S H I V. Um, that's uh, pretty much where I'm most uh, active there. Um, and so uh, I believe you are, well, also, I think that's also where you are most active, Josh. So where can they find you? I'm at, at Joshua Howard on Twitter and Josh underscore Howard on Instagram. And then there's my website and store, which is joshhoward.net. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And those links will be in the description as well. So this was our first episode. Um, Thank you for bearing with us. It's going to take us a while to find our groove and work out all the kinks, but um, yeah, I think we're off to a good start. I can't. We've got so many ideas and shows planned that I can't wait to get into. Uh, we have no shortage of ideas and uh, uh, stories that we want to tackle. So I hope you'll uh, stick around and um, hear what we have to say. We want to hear what you have to say as well. Exactly. The the goal here is to have discussions right it's it's really to 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 dive deep to uh not have it be the surface level veneer that is so common what clogs up the uh, our our communication and, and kind of public discourse we really want to dive deep into things and so do forgive us if uh you know they we're a little rough around the edges uh but we do really feel like what we've got to, to talk about is is really what's going to shine and that's what we're going to focus on rather than all the little bells and whistles and shiny things that you might see on uh on other shows we feel like trying to focus on that would be taking away from the important discussion and that's what we're here for to champion the things that have been written off and to re-examine all of those things that perhaps uh we need to give a second chance to so and it is it is my vow to you that you will never see a thumbnail of me and John's faces reacting to something. <laughs> there will never be a red circle around some <laughs> random thing with an arrow and text going, what does it mean? Also, flaming pile of garbage will never be what we use to describe something. If uh, If we don't like it, we're going to get into very logical, very honest reasons why. And uh, we feel free to hold us to that mark. I mean, we, we are asking uh, for consistent discussion about media, not this kind of willy-nilly all over the map that the zeitgeist just loves to just kind of change the, the kind of the, the rules of storytelling. We really want to burrow down into... Um, uh, like I said, solid discussion about why things work, 
why things don't work. And uh, maybe even sometimes, Josh, we could uh, give our little tweaks that would uh, that would fix something. Those things that are so close. I know those are some of our biggest frustrations. Right. The, the stories that are so close, but they're just missing that one little piece. Yeah, and and John and I, neither one of us are afraid of debate or changing our minds. So if you want to, even if you want to yell at us and tell us we're wrong, I I don't care. I'm not afraid of any of that stuff. Um, we are open to discussion and debate. So, John, thanks for being here. Thanks for joining me on this, and uh, look forward to doing it again. Absolutely, to boldly go where two people who have never done a show <laughs> uh, gone before. We'll see you next time for Deep Dive into Star Trek. See ya.